Welcome to Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop with me, your host, Cool Dude Clem. It's time we made a video, isn't it? Anyway, you're back with me, Cool Dude Clem, in, well, Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop. For the third part of however many parts this video is going to have of the Tesla Coil video, Solid State Tesla Coil Build Video. And also I'm back using my headset microphone, which is this thing I made. Looks ugly, but it works great. Because this microphone, although it sounds good, I have to hold it the whole time, leaving me only one hand free. And also it picks up vibrations very easily, so. And also I'm not using the stereo microphone that I made, because for some reason, I sound like this when I'm talking through that microphone. It's either that or I sound like this. This is Cool Dude Clem in Cool Dude Clem's workshop. Anyway, now that's behind us, let's get on with part three of building a solid state tester coil. So, in this video, I'm going to make the gate drive circuit. Now, in the previous video, I made the gate drive transformer, and that seemed to work pretty well. Apart from a little, couple of little, little mishaps with the oscillator circuit that I made. So now, from all these parts here, I'm going to make the gate drive circuit, the feedback circuit, and even an interrupter. So, as you probably know, this is the circuit that I'm basing the tester coil build on. And I'm going to be building this part of the circuit today. And also this part here. And also, if there's time, I'm going to build an interrupter. Now. This is the original interrupter, which I'm going to build at a later date. But I'm going to build a 555 based term interrupter so I can have pulsed output, and then I'll put in some kind of way of switching that interrupter for the other interrupter so I can do audio modulation, but that's all going to be in a later date. I think the first thing to do is put the gate drive chips on this spare piece of PCB, and we'll see where we go from there. Okay, so here is the gate drive circuit. And, as you can see, it has a whole bunch of wires, so I ought to show what they are. So I've got these two wires here, these are the output wires from each chip. These go to the power supply, this red wire and this green wire, sorry, orange wire and green wire. And this wire here goes to the input pins on each chip, and this wire here goes to the enable pin on each chip. And I just bash the camera. Whereas this wire here is just a ground wire, it's just a temporary wire, so I can see the output at each chip. And also, as you might have noticed, there's a hell of a lot of decoupling. I've got a 10 microfarad capacitor there, then a 100 microfarad capacitor, I mean, 100 nanofarad capacitor there, and a 100 nanofarad capacitor there, so there's 100 nanofarads at the end of each chip. Because these need a hell of a lot of decoupling. If you don't decouple them, they get pretty hot, even with no load. And on the other side, which looks a lot neater, there is the soldering. This is another little temporary thing right there, that resistor, to tie the enable pin high, so they'll, the chips will be on while I'm doing the testing, which I'm going to do right now. So, I'm going to go over to the oscilloscope. Better enable the other camera. And I'll just resize it, so I can get this nice and good. Uh, the joys of having a powerful computer. Now where should I put this? Um, I think, yeah, that's probably a good place to put it, right in the corner there. Let's get testing. Okay, take two, because I sneezed. Okay, so this is the moment of truth. It's wired up to the scope, so we can see the output of both chips. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that Pay no attention to the fact that one of these capacitors is red. That doesn't mean a thing. They're all the same value. Just happens to be what I pulled it out of. But when I turn the power on, one of these should go high and one of them should go low. Don't know which one because I've forgotten which chip is connected to which channel. But let's see. Okay. Well, channel B went high and channel A remained low, which is exactly what I was expecting. So, so far, so good. Okay then, I've got it hooked up to my square wave oscillator and as you can see, it only looks like one chip is working. And that's what I thought at first. I thought, oh no, I've put a dud chip in there. 
It's going to take me forever to unsolder that and put a new one in. However, I went through all the connections, making sure everything is connected up right. And there is a problem with the circuit, and that problem is Clement Sagas. Yes, I got the enable pin mixed up with the input pin. So I'm tying the input pins high and putting the signal into the enable pin. So no wonder it's not working properly. So I'll just go and fix that little problem and I'll be back. Okay, let's try again. I've just completely taken out that 1K resistor that was tying pin 2 high when it should have been pin 3 that was being tied high. Let me just check my data sheet here. Yeah, it's pin 3 that should be tied high because pin 2 is the input pin. But I forgot that the um, pin 3 is internally tied high in the chip. But anyway, let's try again. Okay, this time, none of the outputs have gone high. Which is kind of worrying. Let's make sure this is actually connecting. Oh, there we go. The connections on my power supply are not that good, but now I'm going to do the finger test. This time on pin 2, let's adjust the time base for the lower frequencies for 50 hertz. Let's see what we get this time. Hey, look at that. We got something. Scope's not triggering very well there. Come on, you know you want to, you know you get there. Couldn't I ask for a better result? Okay, well just before I set up the interrupter, as a matter of fact, I already have it built or prototyped on the breadboard. Just thought I'd give the gate drive transformer a test to make sure that's working nice and good and it appears to be. Although, we got a little bit of ringing right there and right there, but we've got nice straight edges there and there. So, really think that's going to be too much of a problem when I put a MOSFET on that, that should smooth that ringing out nice and good. Although this is on one of the lower frequencies, so if I turn the frequency up and adjust the time base, now you can see it. So you can see that ringing we got there. But like I said, I don't think that's going to be a problem when I put a MOSFET on there, because that should smooth that all out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see what kind of a signal we're going to get at the MOSFET gates by this little device here. Got five capacitors which are going to simulate the MOSFET gates gate capacitance and a resistor here which is going to be the 5 ohm resistor going into the MOSFET gate. So I'm going to connect this up to the transformer and let's see what we get. Okay so now I've got my stand in for the MOSFET connected so we're measuring across these five capacitors. Now strangely enough this seems, even though I have nothing connected to the other secondary on this transformer, that the other secondary is going straight into the oscilloscope, and the first secondary is connected to the resistor and the five capacitors, which are representing the MOSFET's gate. And strangely enough, it seems to have affected the signal on both the transformer's outputs. Now, let's just crank up the frequency to what it was before. But you will see that it's a lot better. Still some distortion in there, but now that ringing has completely gone. And that's probably good enough to drive the MOSFET gate. So I'm going to say that works for now. And if the waveform at the gate becomes too much of a problem, well, I've got another idea for a design that doesn't use a gate drive transformer at all. But more about that later if this doesn't work. Anyway, here is the interrupter circuit. There's our 555 timer. At the moment I've just got it blinking an LED. As you can see it makes one pulse every second or so. And I can speed that up by turning this potentiometer and make it blink faster. Well the camera's having a bit of a hard time capturing it though. but uh... I'd say that's a pretty good interrupter. So now I've just got to put that on there. And then... The logic. Oh yes, and before I forget... Schematic... Hold on, let me adjust that. There you go, now you can see it. 
And yes, I came up with this schematic all by myself. Just thought I'd update you on the gate drive transformer business. Well, remember this core, which I painstakingly made? Well, I just ripped a little tiny core out of the input filter choke for a microwave, you know, where the mains comes in. And this is that little core right there. And I've made a five turn transformer out of it. So, uh, check that out. Well, it's tons better than what I was getting with this. And may I remind you that this is on the highest frequency right now, so I'm putting about a megahertz into that. The only thing I'm a little bit concerned about is this This is a little bit warm. If I touch that, I can feel some heat coming off that. It's not burning hot or anything like that, but I think I might be putting this into saturation. The capacitor and the resistor that's feeding it, however, are absolutely stone cold. So I can try it with this one. And I can try it with this one, see which one works best. Let's actually see how low we can make this go. Okay, I'm going to go down in frequency to where this stops looking like a square wave. I know we've still got a little bit of ring, but I think that's just going to happen no matter what I do. So, let's see how low we can go. Alright, let's go. Still looking good. See a little bit of curvature on the lines. Still looking pretty good, it's still looking pretty square. We're at 88 megahertz now. Okay, I think that's about as low as we can go. We've uh yeah, we've lost the square wave now. So I'd say maybe 180 kilohertz is about the lowest we can go, and uh, also we can go all the way up to 1.1 megahertz. So I think we found ourselves a good gate drive transformer. Well, it may look like a bunch of wires and stuff, but to me, this is art. So we got our two gate driver ICs right here. There's the triple five timer that's going to do the interrupting. And I've even gone so far, I wasn't going to do this part yet, but I've even gone so far as to put the logic, gate, the logic gates in. So I've got these wires here, which carry the power in, so there's a 5 amp, I mean, a 5 volt wire and a 12 volt wire. Then this is where the gate drive transformer connects, and this is where the feedback transformer connects. So these two wires there. But of course, the all important question is, does this work? And this is where everything could go tits up. Okay, well it's time to test this thing. First I thought we'd test out the output of the logic chip. I don't know if mum's asleep, so... Gotta keep my voice down. So let's just plug in power, 5 volt power, to the logic. Hopefully nothing should... Hopefully nothing bad will happen. Okay, the line on the oscilloscope has not shifted and nothing's burst into flames, so that's always a good sign. Okay, so now I'm going to plug in the oscillator, which I've got connected where the transformer will be connected. And if we get a square wave, this will be working. And yes, indeed we do. This is at 1 megahertz. Send that down to a much more reasonable frequency. So the 74HC14 seems to be working just fine. Let's actually have a look at the waveform coming in, which should be clipped by these two diodes. Okay, that's an unusual waveform. It's not entirely the waveform I was expecting. I don't know, maybe that is the waveform you're supposed to get. Alright, so let's probe what's coming out of the 555, which is right there. I can see a little pulse on the scope there. Well, everything seems to be working just fine. Apart from the camera, which is having extreme trouble seeing the scope, so I'm just going to adjust the lighting here. And hopefully the camera can see it much better now. So I've got the output from the two chips. Just trying to adjust that a little better so the camera can see it. I don't know why, but on the, um, on the computer right now, it looks like the uh, scope screen is in real life, the scope screen is flashing, but in um, 
on the computer it looks like it's more or less stable and of course it's flashing because of the interrupter turning the thing on and off so let's show you that the interrupter is working or at least try to okay that's flashing on the screen a lot faster than you can see it on the thing the camera's frame rate is really botching things up yeah but there we go I'm gonna say that's a success and it looks like we can get constant wave this way so go from constant wave to interrupted back to constant wave again we've got a bit of a bad connection to the scope there yeah. So, all in all, I'd say that's a 100% success. I know you can see some ringing on the screen there, but that's just simply because of the terrible wires that I'm using to connect it. So, I guess in the next video, we're going to be working on the output stage. So, until then, I'm Cool Dude Clem, and until next time, goodbye. And one final update with the Gate Drive Transformer progress, or at least for this video. As you might be able to see on the scope screen, I have minimized that ringing. There's still a little tiny bit there, but that's a lot better than it was. And the reason is because I've calculated the ideal resistor to use between the driver circuit and the transformer. As you can see, we've got a nice almost clean square wave now. Of course that's not to say when I connect a MOSFET up it's gonna make the wave look like crap again but actually let's see what happens. I've got my stand in for a MOSFET gate so let's just see what kind of waveform we get. Yeah I'd say that's not bad actually. I'd say that's totally usable even though we got a bit of overshoot. So here's how I found the value of that resistor. Or at least according to one of my commenters. Now, I could be wrong about this. I could have got this completely wrong. But apparently, to find the resistance, you take the inductance and you divide that by the capacitance. So, it's 0.000063 Henry's. That's a transformer. And the capacitance is 0.000001 farads. So, that's... 63 microhenries and 1 microfarad which comes out to 63 when you divide those two together and then find the square root of that which is 7.93 so ideally I would need a 7.93 ohm resistor in series with the transformer so I just strung together a bunch of resistors till I got about 7.5 ohms which is close enough and as you saw it works pretty well Actually, to make this easier, I could have just, since the capacitor is 1 microfarad, I could have just taken 63 microhenries and done the square root of that. That would have made it much easier to calculate, but meh, what are you going to do? She won't shut up. Okay, now, why is the camera seeing that? That's not what the camera should see. I'm just having, I'm just setting up my camera here. I don't even know which microphone it's recording from. And somehow we've got um, the other camera looking at something and I don't even know where that is. Oh, wait a minute. I found it. I found the other camera. So we can see both cameras being used to film this video. Oh, actually, there we go. So a crappy little webcam on a piece of cardboard. And my other camera right there, as you can see. It's crazy, isn't it? And in the background, you can see my video capturing software showing the picture from both cameras at once. So I just got to turn off this other camera and make a proper recording. Not this camera, because this is my good camera. This camera's my crappy camera. <laughs>